I am muted. I was muted. <laughs> okay, let me start over. Hello, my name is Ryan Peters. I am floating in space right now. And uh, I am here today at ScalaCon uh, from uh, 47 degrees, uh, soon to be known as Xebia Functional. And I am here to talk to you today about some adventures I've had this past year um, developing a little library that's sort of a new version of Fetch, uh, which is a library that some of you might be familiar with, and some of the decision-making that happened along the way, and how you can maybe apply some of those decisions to your own library making, and also the sort of benefits that we saw when developing this library. And when I say we, I mean mostly me, because I was the one who mostly took charge on this project. So uh, to get us started, I guess uh, we should talk about Fetch. And what is Fetch? If you're not familiar, Fetch is a library in the Scala ecosystem uh, from back in uh, 2016 it came out. There's this blog post I linked to right here, which I'll just tab over to real quick to give you an idea. Uh, May 24th, 2016 is when this came out. And it mentions here in the article that it's influenced by a couple other libraries. One of them is Stitch from uh, Twitter and Haxel from uh, formerly Facebook uh, for Haskell. And the gist of these libraries altogether is that they're for optimizing requests for data. And when you are making requests for data, sometimes it's useful to separate the intention from the actual action of making the request, right? So if I want to fetch something with an ID of A, then an ID of B and C and D, then it should be smart enough on the back end to batch those things together. So it should be able to say, oh, you're making these independent requests. Well, I'm recognizing that and I'm doing this optimization behind the scenes for you. But also if you're making multiple requests for the same item, it will deduplicate them. So uh, let's say, uh, you make a few requests in one part of your code, then you pass that batch of requests to another part of your code and say, hey, if you have anything you want to add on here, go ahead. And you just so happen to request the same thing two or three times. That's wasted effort. That's wasted network, wasted everything. So it will deduplicate that as well. And at least in terms of fetch, I don't know about these other libraries, but it also ensures parallel execution, which is important when... Um, you have cases where the order you get things doesn't matter. If the order doesn't matter, then um, it might as well be getting them in parallel because then you're just saving even more time, usually, anyway. So here's kind of what it looks like to use fetch. Um, I might need to slide to the right a little bit for you to see this full type signature. But in general, what it does is you have this data source type here. You implement this yourself, and it is basically two functions and a couple config params. The functions are how do you get a single element and how do you get a batch. Then you can use the fetch uh, li library right over here and pass your data source to it and make requests for data. So here's an example function where you give it an integer and it will pass it to this data source up here and it will give you an option of string back. So if the string exists, it will give it to you, otherwise it's just a none. So down here, this example code my fetch, we're making three requests, a fetch for one, a fetch for two, and then a fetch for one again. And if you're familiar with cats, you already know the tupled syntax, but basically what this is doing is it's flipping the types inside out. This fetch function returns a fetch of IO option string, and tupled is going to take this tuple and put the tuple on the inside. So it, it takes the first one and then it sort of chains it into the other ones in such a way that you don't really need to know how it works under the scenes, but it does this sort of type magic for you and it gets you this tuple back as the result. And you can see down here at the bottom that when you run the fetch, you get the first result, the second result, and then the first result again. What happens on the back end though, when you run this is one and two will be automatically batched together. And one, this second request for one, will be removed. And it will just get you the result of this first one again. So it saves time, it saves resources. It's pretty much a no-brainer. And it's been a pretty notable staple in the Scala ecosystem for several years as a result. There's a, quite a few other libraries that do similar things as well. So what is fetch lists, the new library. So uh, 
for for various reasons that I will get into over the course of this talk. Uh, it started as a, a port of fetch to a the tagless final style, but it's not entirely tagless final. There's some stuff that's just you know arbitrary Scala stuff in there, but um, for for other reasons that again I'll get into, uh, we're replacing the implicit uh, magic of fetch, which is uh, this this tupled part right here. It is going to have explicit syntax instead of being explicit. Wait, explicit syntax instead of being implicit. As a complete coincidence, it is also a lot faster and it is a lot more lightweight and flexible by design. So the, the by design part is that I wanted to make something that was a little more flexible. The fact that it's faster is just a nice bonus, actually. And I'll, I'll kind of talk into why it's such a nice bonus later. So I gave a talk last year at ScalaCon uh, 2021 called Your Program is a Language. And in this talk, I talked about DSLs. And I'm not going to relitigate the entirety of the talk, but there was a couple things from that talk I wanted to mention. So DSLs, domain-specific languages, they are high-level code that allow you to not need to think about the details of something, essentially. When you're writing React and JavaScript, React is a DSL for creating web pages. And you don't have to think about how you update state. You don't have to think about any of that. You're writing in terms of the React language, in a sense. And fetch is a DSL for data retrieval. You talk about uh, what you want to get, how, it, how you get it. It doesn't matter. Is it running in parallel? Who knows? But it gets it for you. And fetchless is just a different encoding of those same ideas. So uh, oh, in, in the talk, I go over this in a lot, lot more detail. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I would probably bookmark it and just watch it later if I were you because I spent a lot of effort on that one. But um, generally in Scala, most DSLs fall into two camps. I say most, not all, but most. Um, there's the freestyle, which is where you define your operations as data types. And you pass them to interpreters, which are usually functions. And somewhere in the middle there, you might have something like a, a free monad, which is a type of constructor for creating uh, some type of data structure that can flat map and do other sort of programmy things with your operations, which is just data without it. Whereas in tagless final style, you are writing methods, usually on a trait, that are defined in terms of their interpreters. And that's that's a sentence that kind of confused me for a long time when I was learning it. What does that mean, in terms of their interpreters? Well, it kind of looks like this in practice. The top section here, this is more closer to what you'd see in a, in a free style code base. And on the bottom is what you'd see in a tagless final style code base. And you can mix and match these. You can have some parts of your DSL be one or the other, and that's totally fine. There's no wrong way to do this. But they come with pros and cons. The, um, the main thing with the first type, the free type, is you have your operations as data types here. So we, we, call, that, we call this reified. Uh, we say that instead of being a method, it's just a representation of the method and the parameters that go into it. It doesn't actually execute anything. It doesn't represent executing anything. It's just data. So then you pass that to an interpreter, which is usually a function. And the way, the way I like to think about these interpreters is, is kind of like, uh, like coding in Python or something. If you write Python code, it doesn't do anything. If you put Python code in an interpreter, the interpreter figures out what your code means, and then it turns it into a program that is probably executing. In this case, this interpreter is turning our data operations into a program, and by program, I mean something else, anything else, literally anything else. So if you're familiar with writing um, Cat's Effect style code, then you would recognize this probably immediately. This is saying that this is some code where there's an effect, we don't know what it is yet, and it implements the uh, sync type class. So whatever that is, we can plug that in here, like IO or something, and then it would be an IO of A. Or if, it, if, we, if we wrote a version of this for, let's say, uh, like option or future or something, and we change the type signature here to allow that, then it would be an option of A or a future of A, some, something of A. And to build on that in tagless final style, essentially, you have a trait where instead of it being the entirety of your, 
your DSL as a data type, it's as methods that are on the trait. And the, the F type is a type parameter, so it's built into the definition of the DSL. So when you call these methods, instead of creating a data type that you then have to pass to an interpreter, it just gives you the result directly. And the way that you create new interpreters is by creating new instances of the DSL for some concrete F type. So if we cut out this F sync here and we put in IO or future or something, then that is a new instance of my DSL that has its own implementation and so on and so forth. So it works out to be a little bit less code. There's a little bit less redirection, a little bit less um, man in the middle going on. It's, it's automatically faster. There's less data transformation going on. And one other thing is that it lets you have an extensible DSL. So what do I mean by that? In practice, uh, this DSL at the top here, this free one, notice that it's sealed. There's a good reason why we usually want these to be sealed, and that is because when we write our interpreters, it's a good idea to know all the different operations that your program can do, and sealed traits allow you to do that. With Pegless Vinyl Style, however, this one is unsealed, and we could make it sealed if we wanted to, but that's just limiting us because what we want is the ability to uh, extend the DSL. We want to be able to say, um, let's say this one DSL is a low level part of a higher level DSL, and then DSLs are built on top of other DSLs and implement other DSLs. A good example of this is um, the type class hierarchy in uh, CATS, for example, is it's basically using this sort of pattern where one type class implements the members of another type class and they extend that trait. And then implementations of that trait have to implement all of the same members. It's a lot easier when you write it as traits with methods on them than this way. In fact, the, the original paper on this, uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but that's basically the reason why this exists is that someone wanted to have a DSL that was extensible and then they, they formalized the method by which you would do that and that we, we call that tagless final style today. So uh, taking a little bit of a detour back into the actual library and why it matters is um, why, did, why did I do this in the first place? Why did we even look into doing this in the first place? Because fetch works perfectly fine or assuming it, it did. Uh, so late last year, I was uh, rolling off from a client and uh, I was getting put on the bench, which in... in um, uh, consulting terms basically just means, you know, I'm not working with a client and I'm probably working on open source stuff or doing training. And when I'm working on open source stuff, you know, it's kind of nice getting paid to do open source work. So for the, for the limited amount of time I get to do so, someone says, hey, uh, the build for Fetch started failing a few months ago. Can you check that out? And I looked into it. And it turned out that uh, it's failed on an upgrade of cats. And this is weird. This is extremely weird, actually, because if you know anything about the Scala ecosystem, you know that CATS is one of the most, if if not the most, like, well-supported, uh, like, not binary breaking library out there. It's super, super stable. And this should never happen. If you are writing your code to comply with CATS, it would, will likely not break for many, many years. So why was our code breaking? So it, it kind of boils down to the difference between applicative and monad. And in type class terms, when you are saying something is an applicative or has an applicative instance, what we're saying is that we can use it for creating independent effects. So uh, a good example of this might be uh, the uh, cat's validated type you can create results that are independent of each other, and then you can aggregate them together, for example, uh, getting errors together. Monads, however, they build on top of applicatives. However, um, excuse me, uh, monads have the flat map method. And flat map, if you look at the, the type signature, it's, uh, it depends on the value uh, that's inside of the monad, so to speak. It's not not literally inside of, but the value that it represents. So if you have an IO of A and you call flat map on it, then you're passing that A into something else. You're turning it into another IO and then you're sequencing these things together. So it means that there's a dependency relationship between these two effects. Applicatives don't have that. 
they don't have the ability to relate the result of one effect to another one. You can only aggregate them independently. For example, putting them in a list, putting them in a tuple, doing anything side by side where they are not touching each other at all. So in, in practice, uh, like here's, here's an example of kind of what that looks like. Either in the Scala standard library is a monad. And that means that if we flat map, then we get short circuiting. This is one of the first things you learn when you're doing Scala is that how useful either is. And here's some cat syntax you might already know is the sequence method, which is also found on future, by the way, if you don't use cats. So if you ever sequence futures, just kind of pretend you're doing the same thing here with a list. Um, what this translates to in your head should be, I'm taking this first value, I'm flat mapping it into this second value, and then into the third value, and then the fourth, and so on, and so on, and so on. And because it's short circuits, you get a left of two. Now, validated is the applicative equivalent of either that's found in the cats library, which does not have flat map. So how does this translate to a type that doesn't use flat map? Well, actually behind the scenes, what happens is that they basically group these things together as a product. And then the validated type has methods on it that allow it to um, aggregate with other instances of the same type. So it's not actually flat map, but it's something that's like almost flat map. It's um, other people could explain it in better detail than me, but the gist of it is the result of running sequence on validated instead of either is that you don't get short circuiting. You actually aggregate these results. So oh, there's actually a typo here. That's supposed to be four, not two, but uh, pretend that pretend that that's a four right here. Um, it's going to aggregate the errors like this. So there's no short circuiting. Sometimes you want that. Sometimes you want to aggregate values and sometimes you don't. Well, fetch was kind of trying to have it both ways and that's why it broke. So um, there's this link here. I'm just going to go ahead and click here, zoom in a little bit. For your friendly neighborhood, uh, Christopher Davenport is a wonderful man. Uh, number two here on this, this PR here, product slash traverse batching seems like it has to be cheating somehow the monad laws. What does that mean in plain English? Well, um, basically, fetch was trying to pretend to be a monad when it made sense, and it was trying to pretend to be only an applicative that didn't have to obey the monad laws in other times when it was convenient. The problem with that is, okay, when I, when I say laws, if you're not familiar, type classes have laws, which is... It practically speaking, in terms of cats, at least, that's basically a test suite. You put your um, you put your code in it, and it says, "Is this a valid monad or not?" Which means, if I call flat map, if I call these other methods that define what a monad is in here, then it should behave as I expect it to. And it was skirting those. So we actually fixed the issue um, by adding an override, and this is some very kind of confusing looking code, but basically uh, in the monad type class in cats, there's a bunch of methods that you should never have to override because doing so usually doesn't make any sense. And the reason we were overriding them is because we wanted to pretend that we were not bound by these monadic laws. So I just added this override to map to eval, which was some new implementation detail in cats. And the whole the whole issue with this at the end of the day is that why are we overriding implementation details in cats? That's silly. So, in pre so what this would look like is in fetch, this, this, this top code here, this is in fetch. If you have a list of IDs and you are fetching these IDs, so one, two, three, and you're passing this to something, if you call traverse, traverse implies flat map if your type is a monad. It does not imply flat map if it is not. When you call traverse, we were saying, oh, just for this case, we're going to pretend that we're not monadic. And then we would aggregate your request together and it would turn it into um, like a bundle. And that bundle would be used to figure out, it would be used to figure out uh, what value should be deduped, what values should be uh, batched together and so on. Fetchless, on the other hand, looks kind of like this. So you have an instance of this fetch algebra, which I'll describe on the next slide, 
but you, you get this custom syntax instead. And the reason we opted to do this is it makes things a little bit more explicit. It does get rid of some of the magic, but it does make it more clear exactly what's going on. Whereas in this first example up here, you kind of have to read between the lines to think, oh, this is, uh, this is fetching things and it's going to batch them and maybe run them in parallel. You don't know that uh, unless you really like dig between the lines here. Whereas this dot fetch all, it's, it's obvious what's going on. It's obvious that you're fetching them and however it gets them, it doesn't really matter. It also supports implicit or you can explicitly pass it in. It doesn't really matter. So this, this fetch algebra, um, let's go back to the previous slide for a sec. In, in fetch, the fetch type is the type that represents the data uh, that is your requests. It's all of your requests. Whereas in fetch lists, you have the fetch algebra instead, which is a bunch of methods. This is the DSL of fetch list, basically. And there's two ones here I really want to point out, which are single and batch. Single, you give us an ID and you get an F of option A back. And batch, you pass in a set of IDs and then you get a map back. The two in the middle I'll describe in future slides. But um, basically, one of the other things that we did with this library is that it is entirely opt into exactly how much laziness you want. And there is a reason for that, uh, mostly because it allows us to be a lot more flexible and to sort of insert things in between the layers that might be useful. Uh, so in regular fetch, you create these lazy computations. They're uh, entirely opaque to you. You have no idea what's going on. And you know that's, that's OK, but there's no opting out. You can't get a, a slightly less lazy version of a fetch without going all the way to um, just calling the data source directly, which kind of defeats the point. But in fetch lists, uh, the opposite of lazy, I think, is strict. But I, I, cho I chose to use the word linear here because I think it more directly implies the solution that, uh, that I wound up with is that it is linear by default and you can opt into laziness. And when I say linear, I mean that deduping can still happen. You can still deduplicate uh, IDs across requests. It's just that the model has slightly changed. So in the, in the previous library in fetch, it would sort of put all of the IDs into sort of a little basket and it would get them out at the end after it makes all of its uh, batch requests and so on. In fetch lists, we pass this cache map between requests and the, the type, it looks a little unsafe, but actually at the end of the day, it's perfectly fine because we're able to check with, um, so ev every, I'm gonna go back to, the fetch algebra. It's not shown here, but somewhere else down here, there is an ID for every fetch. And this is also true of the original fetch library. For every data source, you also have an ID in, in the original fetch library. This ID is used for figuring out uh, where a request is coming from. So it's able to make intelligent decisions based on that. And as we pass this along, we get this deduped request back from all of our uh, operations or all of the operations that we explicitly opt into deduping with anyway. And for those, there's all, there's some bonus methods on here at the end that I chose not to include, but um, you can take one of these and then chain it into another deduped request and it will pass the cache along from the previous request into the next one. So you can make one request and say you want to dedupe, then you can chain that into a second request and a third and a fourth and fifth. And it will check this cache first before it makes any of the actual requests that you call. Now, laziness is a lot more complicated as it turns out. And oh, I, could, I could talk about so many different things on this slide for days, but I don't have the time. Uh, essentially, uh, instead of having it be the final result, which is that is an F of deduped request, like in the deduping here, for laziness, we are actually uh, creating a sort of pipeline in a sense where we expect a fetch cache from a previous request. And on the other end, we actually get this request info, which is a new type. And there's, there's several types. I've listed two of them here, but there's a lot more. 
um, for other different types of scenarios. But just, just to give you a general idea, like a, a basic kind of request might be defined as a fetch request info or if you want to lift a value into the context of a lazy request. So like, for example, um, uh, you just have a random operation you want to insert in the middle of a series of computations, you can do that. And it will lift up into here and it will execute as normal while still propagating the cache from previous requests. So you could make uh, one request, two requests, uh, you can insert another request before and after that. You can run arbitrary effects in the middle of a series of computations and it will still deduplicate, it will still batch them up together at the end of the day. And it's just a lot more flexible this time because now you can um, now you can think about it in terms of just, it's, it's kind of like a monad transformer in a way. It's, it's taking any arbitrary effect and it's lifting it into this context of passing along a cache of request results. Now, batching is a little more complicated. I mentioned that the original fetch library does this batching for you in a lot of ways. But as, as I stared at the problem a lot more and I thought, well, how can we make this better? How can we do this without, be, without all the magic? Well, there's... The, the main thing that we uh, came, to, came to is that syntax is probably better. It's easier to learn. You don't have to be stacking four or five different concepts on top of each other to figure out how to do something. So at the very bottom here, if you just have a list of IDs, you can fetch all. There's fetch all, there's fetch all dedupe, and fetch all lazy, which is probably the preferred one you want to do because lazy requests are good. You want them to be lazy. And lazy is actually built on top of the deduped one, which is built on top of the not deduped one. And because those two layers are really fast, the lazy one is also pretty fast too. In the middle though, um, we have these requests that are tupled and par tupled. If you're familiar with parallel in cats, uh, basically what's happening here is that there is a parallel version of lazy request that represents a batch. And it is quite complicated if you want to dig into the source code and take a look at that. It, it took, a, took a little while to formulate how that exactly that was supposed to work. But basically, um, it's able to translate between a bunch of requests into a batch. And if you par tupled here, it will turn these into batches and then it will combine all of the different requests you're making. And you have to explicitly opt into that is the main difference. Calling tuple does not batch. Calling sequence or traverse does not batch anymore in this library. But if you call par tuple or par sequence, it does. Now, my line of thinking is, if you are a modern Scala programmer and you're using cat's effect or ZO or anything like that, then you already know to kind of try and opt into this stuff anyway for a lot of stuff. So it's really not that much of a leap to ask people to do to put par in front of it. I think because honestly, the default is you should be probably doing these anyway most of the time unless you have an explicit reason not to. So that's this one thing where we just thought, eh, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter anymore. Nowadays, it probably mattered more back in 2016, back before, you know, the rise of modern effect systems. But now everyone uses par tupled and par sequence anyway. So one less thing for us to worry about. Other changes. Uh, so... This kind of goes into the, the nuts of, and bolts of what uh, decision making uh, goes into making a, a good or better DSL. And the original fetch library had a bunch of things where I thought, well, maybe there's something we can do here to make it a little nicer. Uh, for example, when you make a data source in fetch, which is, one sec. Excuse me. A data source in fetch, uh, that's, again, that's the algebra of you know, how you fetch a value once or as a batch. The, the batch function actually takes a non-empty list. And I'm, I'm pretty sure it does anyway. I, I just double checked before this, but I could be wrong. And that's kind of a weird type to take because, well, one, it has to do a bunch of extra work to turn that into something that's more batchable. So figured, why not just pass in a set, right? Uh, sets automatically deduplicate whatever's inside of them. Assuming that your ID is something basic and, you know, follows standard equality and hash map things like, a, you know, an integer or a string or some other custom type that you have, like a case class, those should all work in a set perfectly fine. So 
just pass in a set. It handles the deduplication part automatically. So uh, this kind of, in, in an early version of Fetchless, actually, I didn't have the, the deduped uh, request at all. I didn't have the lazy version at all. And I just had the basic one. And I had syntax where if you had a, if you had a collection, like a list, it would just turn it into a set, pa pass it in here, and then turn it back into a list. And that works but it doesn't handle all the use cases that the other types handle. So I added those in. And, but it, get, it does get you most of the way, and it is a little bit faster. So if you want to make like an optimization, if you absolutely have to, then that's one thing that you can do now. Other things, uh, implementation details are kind of hiding all over the place. Like here's a really basic example. In your data source, you have the batch execution model it says, you know, how do you want to run your request in parallel or, uh, you know, in, in sequence? How do you, how do you define that? And in fetch list, I thought, well, why not just have this be a smart constructor? So I added these smart constructors here. When you create your fetch instance, you pass in a function that says, um, like here's single sequenced, uh, this will, every time you call the batch function, it will turn that into a sequenced series of singular fetches. Or if you call this single parallel constructor, it will take for for, for your, when you call your batch function, it will just run that in in parallel according to whatever your effect type can do in parallel. And you can also do the opposite, where if you pass in a batch, you can do single fetches in terms of a batch. So you can just make a set of one ID and put that in the batch function and just handle that. Because it captures it at the constructor level, we don't actually have to um, pass anything along later, which is another thing that I'm getting into right now. When you run a fetch, you need the concurrent type class and the clock type class, at least in, at least in one case. Generally, it, when, when you're making a DSL, one thing that I've had to learn over the years is that you do not or should not anyway uh, require a heavy capabilities from the user at places that are just inconvenient. So in practice, when you are writing code with fetch and then you are creating a bunch of fetches and you're stringing them together and you're putting them in a collection and you're saying, okay, I'm going to request all these things. Now I want to get the results. When you run it, you need an, in you need both of these type classes in there. And that's just not very convenient, is it? Because then you have to string that through all of your code. If, if this is five layers deep in your program, then that basically means it's, it just requires a little too much. Like, why do you need to know that this is concurrent? Why do you need to know that this might need the current time? You don't. You don't need to know at all. So let's go back up to this one. When, when we're requiring monad, when we're requiring parallel, that's captured. You don't need all of the fancy um, other capabilities when you actually run the request, at least for the most part. The, the lazy request, actually, to tell you the truth, it does require, I think, you need the ability to map or flat map. But you should have that anyway if you are writing the effect polymorphic code, which is usually the case in Scala libraries. But um, if, if you have you know, functor or monad, which you, almost everybody certainly does, at most points in their code, then you're good. You don't need anything more than that. Another thing, uh, there, there's actually um, an issue on the fetch uh, GitHub that some, someone asked a while back and said, hey, how, how can I uh, run my fetch request with a timeout? The original design of fetch makes this very difficult because you can't just interleave uh, effects together. You can't wrap effects inside other effects. So one way you can do this in fetch list is you can use uh, one of the uh, functions that say returns uh, a like the, the the dedupe one that's not fully lazy, but it gets most of the way there. Now you can wrap this inside of a custom function of your own design that will run it or time out. And then you can chain that into other things and wrap your own effects around those and so on and so forth. It makes it a lot easier to uh, put this into context that need uh, that sort of um, that wrapping ability, the ability to wrap an effect. You, could, you couldn't do that before, but now you can. And also while we're here, let's talk about some, some bonus integrations, I guess, before we get to the meat and potatoes of exactly how fast this thing is. Um, 
you can stream now, which is kind of cool. Um, it do, it's not fully fleshed out as of yet, but like as a proof of concept, yeah. Like if you define a fetch instance, you should in theory be able to define uh, a request for um, for for values that are coming from a streaming data source, and you can get streams back. And there's constructors, so like if you have an instance that is not streaming and you need to use it in a streaming context, you can just wrap it and it will turn it into a streaming fetch that just wraps the existing batch one. Or if you have, um, if you have a, uh, a data source that does have a streaming endpoint or a streaming uh, source, you can supply that yourself and augment an existing one. And this also means that integrations with libraries like databases so uh, Doobie, for example, is a very famous Scala library. Get stuff from your local friendly, maybe not too friendly, JDBC database that has streaming support with FS2. But if you used it with Fetch, you weren't really able to get streaming support. So now you can. And like I said, it's not fully fleshed out as of yet, but as proof of concept, it's there. And you can just create a Fetch that a Fetch instance that will be able to request values from your database and it's sort of it's it's built in it's one of the many different modules that i just wrote up randomly like oh this this sounds like it would be nice other other stuff um i think i think i left this slide in yeah i did okay http 4s uh clients uh you can do those as well i mean obviously it's it's, an, it's a pretty obvious example but if you have one that just saves some boilerplate off um you can, in theory, just wrap anything in here. Just, just the same as all the other libraries, only this has some opinionated decisions and some of these for how you actually get uh, your values. So it makes things a little easier if you're new to writing these. One other fun thing that I thought, you know, some, someone will find this useful. Some, some weirdo will find this useful. Um, why not have the ability to fetch everything? Everything that exists. Uh, everything from your data source, if that's the thing that you might ever want to do. And it's kind of silly. It kind of defeats a lot of the purpose, but, you know, why not? Why not? So uh, there's this straight all fetch in there that has a function batch all. And you, if you have a function that can get everything from a data source, you can do that. It will work with streaming. It will work with Doobie. Uh, there's instances that support both of those use cases. So you can stream everything from a table if you want, and that's, you know, someone wants to do that, I'm sure. It might be nice for debugging purposes, or if you don't want to have to pass around multiple interfaces, you can just use the same one. There's also debugging support. The original fetch had debugging support, and um, funny story, while implementing this, it actually, um, I had to implement some extra code in the core library that wasn't in the debugging library to get this to work, and it I thought it was going to slow it down a bunch, but it actually ended up barely affecting anything at all. So in, in a sense, you kind of get this for free in terms of performance, not, not literally free, but close enough. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that later, I guess, exactly how fast it is. But um, you can time requests, you can figure out what type of request was run and uh, what fetch instances were run by wrapping an existing fetch instance in this debug fetch wrapper and then you call methods on the wrapper and then they'll be able to give you a bunch of logs that uh, tell you exactly how it happened so in this case here's one that says it requested from this fetch that had an id of id it took five seconds to run which is, is it's a while but you know for, for the sake of illustrating and then it tells you the type of fetch so this is just a singular fetch it can also tell you if a batch was run it currently does not tell you if a lazy one is run because I don't really know if there's that much benefit to that. Really, the only ones you really want to know are if it's a single or a batch. And uh, I think it also keeps track of if it was deduplicated or not. But lazy ones, they just count as the deduplicated uh, versions of single or batch fetches. So now it's time for a live benchmark demo before we finish up here. Um, bear with me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and god help me i'm going to try and share the window of the actual code that i am sharing here uh, all right i am trying to share it but it is not showing up on the screen oh there it is okay 
So a uh, quick note about this before we begin. Um, these benchmarks are not like published in an official capacity. I know, I know, I know. Everyone talks about benchmarks and authenticity and all that. Just so you know, this is only benchmarking fetch against fetch list. So there's no other third party libraries in here. Not as of yet anyway, because one at the time I wrote this, I had no idea what I was doing. And also, um, it was just more as a way to check, you know, did I make a decision in here somewhere that accidentally slowed everything down or not? So um, what 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 we're doing here is there's some test programs, and I didn't give these very good names at the time I wrote this up. But uh, in a nutshell, I'll actually scroll to the bottom, it gives you better information. I have this function collect average, which will run a program a certain number of times and then collect the average amount of time it took to run. And... We're running each of these 40 times and collecting that average. And the first one that we're running is actually called program six for reasons I don't know. Um, this is uh, just an immediate fetch. So no deduping, no laziness. This is the fastest it can possibly go. This is not very useful because most of the time you're not gonna use this. Um, immediate deduped fetch. Uh, this is when you're calling the, uh, the single dedupe method. And then there's lazy request, traverse, and par traverse. The actual test is I am, I have, I have a list of 1 to 50,000. And a, a quick note about speed here. The original fetch library is perfectly fine. When I say that this is in order of magnitude faster, I mean in the absolute dumbest possible scenario in which it could possibly matter, which is you've written some horribly unoptimized code and when you run it, it's, it's, you, don't, you don't want something like this to slow down your program that much. I mean, like if, if you are actually writing this code, you know, how, what, what is the fastest it can possibly run is basically what this is. We're creating a dummy fetch instance here that will um, give us just back the, the ID that we request. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. It will give us back the ID that we request, request <laughs> raw. So... From 1 to 50,000, it is requesting 1, and then 2, and then 3, and 4, up to 50,000, 40 times. And that's for each of these tests. And I'm going to go ahead and run the benchmark. And just show you how long this takes. I think the last time I ran this, it took something like 30 seconds to actually get all of the results. So uh, this, uh, the lazy request traverse, this is actually going to run them in sequence. Par traverse is going to attempt to convert it into a batch first and then execute the batch. In practice, you want to use par traverse. The benchmark is going to show it as being slower, but it's actually not slower. Or may maybe it does. I think, yeah, in, in real life, you want to only run batches. You want to only run parallel whenever possible. You do not want to just run individual fetches in sequence like that. So, okay, here's the results we got. These are in terms of, I think they're in terms of milliseconds. Let me double check. But um, the immediate one is the fastest with, at about 2.5 E7. Uh, the duped is a little bit faster, but I assume that's margin of error. It's probably margin of error. Uh, the ones that are important are the lazy ones. This one's at 5.6 E8. This one's at 4.0 E8. And remember, it's running four benchmarks 40 times each, and it took about 42 seconds. So that's, that's a decent amount of time. It's not like immediate, but it is running a bunch of stuff. And the, the lazy ones are a bunch slower than the immediate request. Of course they are, because it's doing a lot of extra work behind the scenes. It's trying to aggregate your requests, and it's trying to do a bunch of data transformations behind the scenes. And you might think, well, the lazy one can't be that much faster than regular fetch, can it? Well, actually, let's, let's show you exactly how slow the original fetch is in this exact same scenario. Let me share a different window. I hope this shows up. Okay, so this is the same code. It's basically the same code. And we're using traverse instead of par traverse because par traverse doesn't exist for fetch. It, regular traverse is doing the same thing as par traverse. So let's run that. And this is going to, believe it or not, this is actually going to take about as long to run 
as the previous attempt, which was running four benchmarks 40 times. This is running one benchmark four times. And it's going to take as long. If not, maybe just slightly shorter. We're just going to sit here staring at my console. Okay. 6.6E9. .6 so that, that E there, it, it is an order of magnitude longer to get the, the same sort of set of results in regular fetch. That's kind of nuts. And, and it's, not like they've, it's not like it was originally written to be slow. It's just like that was the style at the time. And now if we write it a slightly different way, it's just that much faster by coincidence. I never, you know, believe it or not, I never actually attempted to optimize this at all. I'm going to go back to the slides. Just a sec, because there's one more slide on here. And yeah, I never actually intended for Fetchless to be so fast. You might ask, why is it so fast? But to put it simply, um, it's doing a lot less work. When you write a DSL in this style, if you are writing in this style first and foremost, um, it will basically, uh, there's, just, there's a lot, lot less work to do. There's a lot less transformations going on. The only time the transformation actually happens is on the lazy layer, the dedupe layer, and the regular layer. There's almost nothing. So there's no magic tricks. There's no uh, implicit batching. And it gets you virtually the same place while also being a lot more flexible for integrations and al allowing you to plug more stuff in. Um, what's next, though? Uh, the, the docs and website do not exist. There is a big old readme. Uh, the, the library is also not published. Uh, <laughs> you can go to this GitHub page right here, and you can download the code yourself. You can run it yourself. The benchmark is there if you want to critique it and tell me how horrible it is, because it probably is. It's not very good. It was it was just more very informal, but um, yeah, um, it's going to be up eventually, probably within the next several weeks. I just I literally have not had enough time to work on this. I've been I've been at a client this year, and uh, we've been we've been trying to get things worked out behind the scenes to get this pushed up. But once it is, we'll have a blog post on it. We'll talk about it some more. Maybe we'll have some more integrations, maybe some examples and documentation and stuff like that. But that's all I've got. If you want to look at these slides for later usage, you can go to this website here, slides.rpeters.dev slash fetchless dash scalacon. And thank you so very much for joining. It's been a pleasure. And uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Hey Ryan, thanks so much for your talk and for being here with us today. We have a question so far, so hopefully a few more will come in uh, as we're speaking. The first question is, can Fetchless be used by GraphQL libraries like Sangria or Garkle? Which other examples of the libraries can benefit from extending Fetchless? That's a great question. Uh, so like the original Fetch library, Fetchless is entirely data source agnostic. You can do anything you want behind the scenes. You can have an instance that requests all kinds of different stuff. The thing, though, is uh, GraphQL is made for um, more like dynamic queries, right? So you might want to request some values and not others sometimes. And in order for that to work with a library like this, you would basically need to create an instance, uh, one for every um, type of request you would make. At least that's, that's what I imagine you would have to do. So it is possible. It might not be super ergonomic, but uh, that's sort of the cost because each type of request is a type of result, and this will deduplicate based off the type of results. Um, other examples of libraries, based, yeah, like I said, basically anything. Um, if you get data from somewhere, if you are storing it locally, if it's on another server, anywhere, if you want to optimize how fast it takes to get that data, put it in here. Excellent. That was a really nice question, and, and thanks for, for answering it. I don't see any more questions right now, but we hope that you get to hang around, hop in, and the virtual environment some more. And if any other questions come in, uh, we'll let you know. But 
thank you for being here as always. It's always great to have you. And uh, we're going to take a short break before the next talk. See you next time. Thank you very much. Firing retro rock. Roger, Matt. Ready to eject.